Welcome to X Girls, where we answer all of your questions about the impact of the sex industry and life after sex work. My name is Ashley Abercrombie, and I'm your host today. I'm here with Harmony Dust, founder of Treasures, an outreach and support group to women in the sex industry based in the San Fernando Valley of LA. We also have Chrissy Moran, who works at Treasures as one of the peer mentors. And finally, we have Bronwyn Healy, founder of Hope Foundation in Australia, an outreach to women in prostitution. What's great about this show is that we're actually answering viewers' questions from the perspective of women who have been in the industry. Harmony is an ex-stripper, Chrissy is an ex-porn star, and Bronwyn is an ex-prostitute. And together, they are the ex-girls. Over the course of this series, we are going to be discussing the impact in the sex industry and life after sex work. We'll also be answering viewers' questions. But before we get started, we're going to hear a little bit about each of the panelists' stories. So first, we're going to talk to Harmony. So Harmony, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, where you come from? Absolutely. So I was born and raised in Venice, California, in a neighborhood called Ghost Town or Oakwood. And essentially, um, a pretty violent neighborhood and a violent home. Um, I remember watching a man stabbed to death in front of my eyes, wow. um, probably five feet away from me, and I just covered my brother's eyes and we just walked the other direction. But the thing is, is that I didn't even go home and tell my mom because that was not an unusual thing for me to see. Um, and so that's just some context there. So I just grew up with a sense of lack of safety and stability. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was exposed to pornography for the first time when I was three years old by my father and then sexually abused throughout my life by multiple people, both men and women, starting at the age of five, and then raped as a teen as well. So I just had a lot of um, self-hatred, loathing. I felt a deep sense of shame. Um, and I think, too, one of the reasons there's such a high incidence of sexual abuse um, in the history of women in the sex industry is that, you know, for me, I know I started to become comfortable with being sexualized and objectified, and mm. that's kind of the way I learned to relate to the world. And so, one of my abusers was actually my mother's boyfriend, and this is when I was 13. And so, I finally started standing up for myself, and I was like, he has to go, or I'm going. Ran away from home, and so my mom, she realized I was serious, so she said, fine, he's leaving, don't worry, come home. And so, I came home. And she actually ended up leaving me at 13 with my eight-year-old brother for three months. And she handed me $20 and a book of food stamps. Wow. And she was like, I'll be back in a couple weeks. But she came back three months later. Um, and it was that summer that I started stealing to feed my brother and I. And it was that summer that I became involved with an older boy in the neighborhood who, you know, at the time I was like, oh, he buys me food and he makes me feel protected. He tells me, anybody messes with you, tell him I got your back. Like, he made me feel safe. But now looking back and knowing what I know, I can see that he was preying on my vulnerability and, yeah. and really kind of grooming me essentially. And it's funny because this concept of grooming comes up when, it when you talk about pimps and how they you know, get young, vulnerable girls into sex work and you know, they take them, get their nails done, get their hair done, you know, buy them clothes. And I'm like, all you had to do was buy me Burger King, like vegetarian <laughs> burger, <laughs> cheeseburger without the meat. And I was very like, California. oh my gosh, you're so, yeah, very California. <laughs> Um, so anyways, it was that relationship that led me into the sex industry at 19, working as a stripper, and essentially he, he became my pimp. Wow. And so then, so you went into the sex industry, like you just said, but can you tell us kind of the journey to getting in there? One of the stories actually that stands out to me is the professor that you talked to on campus. Yeah. Can you so, share that story too? Yeah. So when I was 17, I lived in a, a group home. And I got it in my head by w talking to the staff there that if I was going to get out of the life I was in, education was the key. So I began really applying myself to education because I thought it was like the life raft that I was going to hang on to. And so um, I was in college studying to get you know, a degree in psychology and I wanted to be a psychologist. And I was working full time, going to school full time. and. Um, you know, that was at the point in my life that people started saying, well, you should be a stripper and you need money. And of course, my boyfriend was like, oh, I'd do it if I were a woman and you should do this and you should do this. And so I was like, I, I didn't want to ruin any prospective chance of being a psychologist. So I went to my professor, whom I really respected, who was a psychologist, and he was young and handsome. And, you know, I looked up to him and I said, you know, what do you think? Everyone's telling me I should be a stripper. I need to make money. I don't know how I'm going to support myself. I've been on my own since I was 17. And He's like, you know, it's not like you have to put it on your resume. Hmm. And then, you know, by the way, which club are you thinking of working at? And sure enough, you know, he came in a couple months later um, for his bachelor party and tried to get a dance for me. And I was like, wow. yeah. 
So that that really let me down, and I really developed over time this this um, this belief that men were horrible. I don't believe that now, but I was like, all they want is sex. There's no good guys, and he was like, I felt like he was like, I had him on this pedestal. And I was like, there's one good guy on the planet, and it's him, this guy. And then <clears throat> when that, that happened, I just I felt like something broke in me. I became so angry at men that I was violent. I mean, I would take off my stiletto and hit you in the face wow. if you mess with me. <laughs> but I'm, I've changed. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And can you tell us just a little bit about how you got out of the industry? Yeah, so essentially for me, it was a friendship. A woman who just loved me unconditionally, came alongside me, didn't judge me, didn't make me feel like I was a mission project, mm -hmm. invited me to church, but her friendship wasn't contingent on me going with her. That's great. And it was through her friendship that I began to experience the unconditional love of God, and eventually I took her up on her offer to go to church, and I felt like I didn't know much, but I knew I was home and I was gonna do whatever it took to keep showing up. And I would go to church on a Wednesday night and go to the strip club afterwards. Cause I was like, <laughs> I need me some Jesus. I still gotta pay my bills, I don't know, but I need me some Jesus, so. Um, but being exposed to this message that I was hearing from my pastor, that I am created with a purpose and that I am valued and that I am loved and yeah. that God will never leave me nor forsake me, that started to really take root in my heart. And it, it ended up developing and changing in my life and it came from this place of revelation. I remember standing in the middle of a strip club one night and being like, if I'm created with a purpose, this can't be it, there has to be more. So it was from that place that I started making changes. Wow, thank you so much for sharing, Harmony. Thank you. And next up, we're gonna hear from Chrissy.